Good evening, everybody. My name is Catherine Matthews, and I'm the Director of Education at the Old North Church and Historic Site. Please note that tonight's speaker event is being recorded. Additionally, we ask that you keep yourself on mute until you want to join the conversation. As we begin, let us acknowledge those who came before us and whose stories may not be widely known. At the Old North Foundation, we continuously strive to deepen our knowledge of the past and to share our history with honesty and respect for those who came before us. Old North site was once the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. When Old North was found in 1723, the Massachusetts communities in this area had already been decimated by disease, trafficked into enslavement, removed from their homes, and forced to assimilate to European culture. Despite this devastating reality, the Massachusetts people survived, and their descendants carry on the knowledge and traditions of their ancestors. Their story is part of our shared American story. Thank you all for being with us tonight as we continue our look at the life and legacy of David Walker, a 19th century black abolitionist. In a little bit over a month on January 26th, we will have our third and final Walker related program. Professors Cabria Baumgartner, Jonathan Chu and Jessica Linker will participate in a panel discussion on the conflict between belonging and excluding in this nation's history. And we'll explore questions such as what does it mean to be a citizen? And how can communities assert belonging when their stories have been erased? You can register on Eventbrite and we hope you will. These stories, as well as the two earlier programs, these programs rather, as well as the two earlier programs in our fall speaker series have been made possible by generous support from Citizens Bank. So tonight, tonight we will be taking a closer look at David Walker's 1829 pamphlet, An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. The appeal was widely read, widely shared, and widely impactful. We are fortunate indeed to have Lamerchi Frazier and Peter Snowed with us tonight as we embark on this exploration. Lamerchi is an artist, activist and an educator, and is also the Director of Education and Interpretation at the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. Peter is an award-winning playwright, history buff, and a former journalist who has written a play about Walker. He is also a member of the Beacon Hill Scholars, which is a nonprofit group dedicated to raising public awareness of the historic Black community on Beacon Hill, a community which, of course, included David Walker. So tonight's program is a bit of an experiment and we are excited to get started. And here's how it's going to work. Lamerchi will start by giving us a little context for the appeal in terms of Walker's life and the socio-cultural and political world in which he lived. Peter will then offer us some insight into the way the appeal is written. Then we have five excerpts lined up, one from the preamble and one from each of the four articles uh, or sections. You should have received them via email through Eventbrite. We will hear them read aloud and then Lamerchi and Peter will discuss them. And we hope that you will share your thoughts and reactions freely. You can utilize the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you and you'll chime in. At the end, we will hopefully have a few minutes for more general Q&A, and then Lamerchi and Peter will offer some closing thoughts. So now, one thing to ask you as we get started, would you pop into the chat and share your reactions to the appeal or to those excerpts that we shared? We'd love to know what you were thinking. Okay, and now let's get started. Lamerchi, floor is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, it is a pleasure indeed to be here and invited in to the House of Old North and to discuss with Peter Snowd the life of, a, uh, of an extraordinary, visionary, prophet and abolitionist, David Walker. 
uh, David Walker was born free into a world of slavery. And he was born in 1796 in an area of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina called Lower Cape Fear. And this place that he was born into has an extraordinary uh, sense of what is happening in America with regard to slavery because there are three to one enslaved people to every white that is there who are black. And then there are the mixtures of free and enslaved people in that population. So when we look at a David Walker, who was born into this environment of slavery as a free man, his father, Anthony, was uh, enslaved, but his mother was free. So therefore he is born free. That is the definition of how he is identifying. He is educated. He is uh, in an area where um, in North Carolina that is peopled by uh, a very interesting group of people who are organizing themselves, who are looking at what is this thing called slavery, who are in the measure of slave revolt, if you will. And when we look at by 1796, we have the winds of revolution that have been happening, not only the American revolution, but the Haitian revolution. And the idea that impinging on the freedom of uh, those who are enslaved is this, uh, this nature that makes them know that they are entitled to freedom. Based on the moral teachings, uh, they are organizing themselves in spaces where they have been denied gathering and assembling except for religious reasons. And so the church immediately becomes this pay place where they can talk and they can convene and they can um, um, discuss strategies where they can discuss uh, their lives as they exist and what they will do about it. So in um, this area of, of North Carolina you have or, and South Carolina along the uh, Southeast coast, you have had already rebellions. You have uh, one in 1721, another one in 1745, 1747, 1767, and one great one in 1800s that has produced people who understand their right to be free and are ready to do something about it. So in reaction to that, you have, um, have had the Revolutionary War, which um, enables uh, John Quincy Adams to think about whether we want black patriots in that American Civil War. And it is a general in Virginia who admonishes him to understand that it is black people who are, and, and this is a quote, on September 70, 1775, John Adams fretted over the risk of enlisting the support of Georgia and South Carolina in the revolution because of their huge problematic black population. And this black population was uh, uh, composed of people who wanted to be free by any means necessary, if you think about it. And that the, he said that the Negroes have a wonderful art of communicating intelligence among themselves. It will run several hundreds of miles in a week or a fortnight. Despite the efforts of whites to delimit the revolutionary favor to themselves alone, many blacks fo shared fully, if not as publicly, in assenting to the era's persuasive anti-colonial and democratic ideology. So from that, we, we can get that there is this air of freedom in the world. It is not just here in America, it's in Haiti and, and in that speak, this is David Walker's milieu. This is his, the massaging of him as a man as he grows up in this, this arena. And as we look at the 
movement that is producing free people and enslaved people in the same place, we have an economy that is affected by that. Whites are uh, in general, very bereft at there being free labor available because they cannot be employed. And free blacks have even a harder time being employed. And so with this combination and mixture of things, David moved from, and that's, that's some of the complexity. I'm not going to say that I can offer all of it at, in this point, because that's a, probably another two lectures. But when we talk about uh, David uh, moving from, uh, from where he was in Wilmington, North Carolina, he goes to South Carolina, where Charleston is a very, uh, another vibrant place of Blacks and their organizations and their, uh, 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 their rebellion. And we know about the very important rebellion of 1822 with Denmark Vesey. And it is said that Walker was around that area and in conversations uh, with him. But what I wanted to say about Walker's world at that time is that it is marked by notable organizational structure because Blacks in uh, Charleston are organized into groups that fit their needs like the Brown Friendship or Fellowship Society, which was full of refugees from Haiti, from, uh, from uh, Santo Domingo. And, and, and they formed for their purposes as lighter complexion mulattoes to be able, and that's what they were called then. That's not what we would say now, that's not proper. But um, at that time, that's what they were referred to, to meet their needs. And then there was an organization of free and enslaved black society uh, of the dark men of color. And another one that was an educational um, society for the minors moralist society. So when we look at this idea of black people being in, imbued with organizational structure, David is growing into this idea of being able to be present, to be, uh, um, uh, uh, forging his way through this understanding of networking and organization. And so when he arrives in Boston, um, we, we have to understand that he's worked with the people who are in that insurrection in Denmark VC's 1822, um, 1822 moment. And they have already talked about the, the, the two of them, um, Denmark VC and David Walker about informants and people who was what we call today snitch uh, on, on what the conspiracy was. And so they were working toward this idea of blacks being unified enough to, to shield the conspiracies to end their enslavement. And um, as he arrives in Boston, he is in a city where Prince Hall, in uh, 1770, manumitted by 1775, is, uh, informing a group of men who are to be leadership through the Masonic order. And by, 18, uh, by 1787, they have received their charter from London and are operating. And what we find about this landscape in Boston, that this laid landscape of Boston uh, to what would be uh, the Atlantic world, that the Masons then are in, in, uh, involving Masonic um, Masonic order with evangelism and Christianity, that these are two operating principles that are there and that the, the components of evangelism, benevolence, charity, universal love and grace are what uh, Prince Hall and his men are advancing and the movement of expatriation, going back to Africa or immigrating to Haiti, that is a part of what the, the, they are pronouncing and they're committed to ending slavery and freedom, unlike other uh, Masonic lodges at the time. And they declare themselves absolutely dedicated to being free and independent. It is uh, John T. Hilton, who was here in Boston, who says, we will not be tributary. We are devoted to this cause of ending slavery. We are devoted to what has begun as this movement of benevolence, 
to now understanding that our that we ourselves and by our rights are to work in unison as a people of color and to free and independent to be free and independent of other lodges and so this is what walker comes into in 1825 we know that he's only here about what five to six years we're only graced with his presence for that time and so as uh, we think of the men that he's meeting with who have now come to the point where they are changing their direction, that they are here and they're gonna be here. They're devoted to what's happening here and not exp expatriation to Sierra Leone and Liberia uh, by 1829, that's, that's where they are. Um, but just before that, as um, the, first black anti-slavery society in Boston that we know, know about that's operating on Beacon Hill, where Prince Hall has directed black men to purchase property um, uh, and where they have built an African meeting house and a free black community of agency, organizing itself, networking itself, that Freedom's Journal, which is the first black newspaper um, that's actually begun in New York, 1827, um, is operating and the uh, Massachusetts General Colored Society, which is the first black anti-slavery society that we know of in Boston, there may have been others, but David Walker, as he's here in Boston, he comes, becomes a member of that society. He becomes not only an advocate of abolition, but he's a writer. And he writes for Freedom's Journals. He is an agent of that paper. And in that paper, what he does is admonish people to be united in this cause. And um, one of the, the things that he says in a speech to the, the Massachusetts General Colored Association in uh, December of 1829, he says, the primary object of this institution is to unite the colored population so far through the United States of America as may be practical and expedient, forming societies, opening, extending, and keeping up correspondence and not withholding anything. He is fervent in his admonishing of the, the work of being black, of being free. And this group of abolitionists is looking at facing this crisis of being Black. This is a crisis to them. And they use Christianity that was embraced by the Masons, that was that is alive in the southern states, as a marriage of moral um, adherence, but as an instrument that is then pressed through the media and publication. And so therein we arrive, and this is a very, you know kind of cut short version of this, but, and it's so hard to talk about him because he had so many dynamics to his life. But as we think about the use of his words and publication, he is writing the appeal. He's written the appeal and he's an owner of a, a using, used clothing store on Brattle Street in Boston. He's got the force of the Massachusetts General Colored Association. He's got the force of the Masonic order that he belongs to. He's got the force of a free black community with him. And they are all strategizing and networking to get this appeal distributed in the South. And so he is going to rely on that which he left in South and North Carolina and, and the seacoast of the runaways the Maroons who form their own groups that resist slavery and this kind of swamp culture that is moving in, through the tributaries of the rivers along that area to distribute this pamphlet. And another way of this distribution becomes to line the soldiers, um, the, the sailors who come into his shop to buy coats and line their, their uh, vests with the, the pamphlet. So this strategy of distribution of this very incendiary document becomes the focus 
in Georgia and South Carolina of laws that are adopted to even hold sailors back at the port, not allow them to integrate into the populations that may receive this literature. Because people, regardless of what we think about the mythology of what was existed in slavery, there are people who can read. There are people who can meet. And this document becomes a very ardent force in, in making the thinking about not being mediocre, being excellent in your striving. That's one of his principles. The other is to encourage people before prophets and, and to be human to the interest of what would be implied by uh, taking the opportunity of self-government, of self-governance, even that which was uh, exemplary of the Haitian revolution. And so as this pamphlet is being distributed, the, um, <laughs> there is a reward put out on his life, uh, $3,000 dead and $10,000 alive and in the South to make a principal example of him. Um, meanwhile, we know that he has spoken with a woman in Boston who lived next door to him on Joy Street, Mariah Stewart, who is an evangelist and an exhorter also, who is in the political arena. And that brings up David Walker's support of women and voting. I, I, most people don't talk about that aspect of him, but she even quotes him in her later writings and is one of the first suffragists by uh, um, 1833, if you will, in Boston. But more importantly, as he has built this world, it, as he is integrating and moving in this world that is built around the idea of freedom, democracy, and public republicanism. And he is refuting Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia that says Blacks are beasts and have no creativity. And even Phyllis Wheatley is not a poet. All of these uh, uh, um, um, uh, kind of treaties that reduce and oppress Black people he is also, um, get, he marries into a Boston Brahmin family. His wife's name is Eliza Butler. And he has a son, Edwin Walker, who to give you some idea of what his political influence was after the Civil War, his son is one of the first elected representatives to the Massachusetts legislature in, in uh, 1866. So this kind of aspect of David um, I could talk about him all night, and I want to give others the, the, the opportunity to say what they have to say about David Walker. This dynamism that he presents is a challenge not only to whites, but to Blacks to govern themselves in a world uh, milieu, in a world, not just the United States particularly, but as he talks about the landscape and the, what we call now the global majority of three quarters of the planet being black and brown people. He is operating with others, others in abolition who are traveling to England, uh, greatly is uh, acknowledged their mobility. He is acknowledging that this is peculiar and particularly addressed to those who are in America, but it is a part of a global presence that he's encouraging. Thank you so much, Lamarchi. That was fantastic. Um, Peter, would you like to talk a little bit about the writing itself? Of the sure. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Thanks, Lamarchi, for that, that great overview. Um, I just actually want to add a couple of things uh, to the context and then talk a little bit about some of the themes uh, that come through in uh, for me anyway, in um, in the appeal, and I'd love to hear what other folks feel about that. Um, a couple of things to just for us to bear in mind that in 1829, when, when the appeal was published, uh, Boston was an extremely hostile place for Black folks. Um, what else is new? Um, but, uh, you know, and, and Lamucci alluded to this, is that there was this scientific racism that was growing, uh, which 
held that black people were subhuman. They were not even, um, you know, human beings. Um, and actually, Walker in the appeal refers to uh, to black folks being, uh, you know, uh, uh, referred to as, um, you know, uh, of, of of tribes of monkeys and orangutans. Um, and as the much alluded to, the, you know, Jefferson and others. Um, uh, sort of legitimized this this form of anti-black racism that um, so it was the time when you know if folks from the black community on Beacon Hill went across Boston Common they were at constant risk of being attacked and beaten up by white people so um, so there was that and um, uh, and and Walker was determined to challenge. Jefferson and others who were legitimizing this kind of racism because he saw that this would be totally institutionalized in American society unless it was it was it was seriously challenged. Um, uh, I think the uh, the other thing just to uh, mention uh, contextually is that abolitionists at this time, eighteen twenty nine, were very small in number and were widely despised um, by white folks. Um, and it was, you know, they, they were uh, regularly or at risk being attacked uh, in, public, in, in uh, public meetings and so forth. Um, and the abolished, abolition movement that we, we think about really didn't get into gear in any meaningful way until the beginning of the 1830s. So at this point, um, you know, you have this very hostile atmosphere and this black man uh, suddenly appears in print with this devastatingly uh, argued critique of white hypocrisy, white Christian hypocrisy around slavery. And he takes on white leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, and he calls them out, you know, directly, uh, with righteous rage, with eloquence, with passion, and with humor, with sarcasm. Um, and as uh, Dr. Celine Washington said in the previous uh, series, uh, speaker series uh, presentation, Walker had the temerity to say that God was on his side. Um, and I, I just want to say that I think in, in, in writing the appeal, in distributing it, Walker essentially put a bullseye on his chest. Um, it was an act of self-sacrifice. Uh, as Dr. Washington also said, Walker was going to risk it all because that was what he was called to do. Mm -hmm. um, and he must have known his life was gonna be short. In fact, he refers to it in the appeal, he writes, I write without the fear of man. I am writing for my God and fear none but himself. They may put, to, put me to death if they choose. Now you might hear an echo of that speech or that uh, thought in the last speech that was made by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, April 3rd, 1968, before he was assassinated. He wrote famously, I mean, he said famously, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And interestingly enough, when King was killed, he was in his early thirties. When Walker died ostensibly of tuberculosis, but of course there's a strong kind of opinion that he was assassinated by, um, by sub agents of Southern planters or somebody hostile. He was also in his early 30s, so two early martyrs to the cause. Um, so uh, going to the, to the sort of the characteristics of the appeal, I was kind of um, reading it again, uh, you know, in preparation for, for us for this, for this gathering. And I, I just remembered how when I first read it, um, how powerful it was, um, but I also found it both somewhat, um, I was blown away, but I find it sort of somewhat confusing at times, um, repetitive occasionally, 
Uh, he would make detours. And I think once I understood the context in which he was writing and what he was trying to do, it, it made a whole lot more sense. Um, but I think two things to say about it, uh, of course, lots to say, but two things I'll just highlight. One is that this, the appeal was written to be spoken. Um, uh, you know, uh, what Walker expected was that he would recruit or there would be recruited black leaders in communities in the South who were literate. Um, yes, there were a lot of literate uh, black folks clandestinely, but uh, the vast majority did not have access to the chance to learn to read and write. In fact, it was illegal to do so. And, you know, you could be whipped or worse if you were caught doing it. So um, he hoped that he would, that, that black leaders would take it upon themselves to, um, to, to recite this, essentially this speech to gatherings of folks who wouldn't otherwise have access to it. Um, and you can hear the preacher, obviously, the, the evangelist in his writing, uh, those, those stirring cadences, the, um, the, you know, that, 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 that rhetorical, um, uh, Jerry Mann. Uh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Jerry um, and, um, so the other thing I want to say that struck me again, reading it, and this is throughout the, the appeal is, is the tone. It's a tone of authority and total conviction uh, and certainty. Um, he almost dares white people to contradict what he's saying and what he's implying. Um, prove me wrong is what he's saying. And I, I think it, it, it's quite extraordinary that he maintains that, that, that energy and that pace and that authority throughout throughout the document. Um, so uh, I think maybe we could go to the preamble as the first thing. Um, yes, before we, we go to... there, yeah, um, I would like to comment that um, when we talk about David Walker and the Bible and Christianity, that we have to recognize that there is movement among black people to use this as an instrument for metaphor of the circumstances mm -hmm. for which they were found in. And when he talks about that as an anti-slavery tool, um, he, he speaks in, a, in this one of these quotes, your full glory and happiness as well as those of all other colored people under heaven shall never be fully consummated but with the entire emancipation of your enslaved brethren all over the world. For I believe it is the will of the Lord that our greatest happiness shall consist in working for the salvation of our whole body. Mm. When this is accomplished, a burst of glory will shine upon you, which will indeed astonish you and the world. There is a great work for you to do as trifling as some of you may think of it. But for Walker, this is this idea that there was this, that we have been removed from the construct of a land that gave us different languages um, to negotiate thought. And that it is, as we look at the preamble we, and the other uh, men of color quote, that there is this idea of being able to um, become literate and use the Bible to somewhat look at the syncretization of what thought in African patterns of thinking and African descended people were thinking and through their rituals and community would be able to not be so identified in the Western world as subversive. So that is another context that we have to think about Walker being in Gullah lands, in Gullah territory, that is about not just this pure Christian thought as it is. And I, I often ask the question, would Christ want to be Christian? 
um, the way that Christianity is uh, being used as an instrument to, to even justify slavery. Uh, but that this is an important point to um, look at Walker's um, refute and resistance to uh, what Christians were espousing and the hypocrisy, as you were saying, um, Peter, that was persistent. So with that, let's uh, dive into the appeal. I'm going to put up on the screen the excerpt from the preamble. Now, let me see. I am not the most fluent technophobe or technophile, so things just happen sometimes. There we go. And there we go. So, um, Peter, would you like to read this? Oh, you want me to read it? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I will ask one question here. Can our condition be any worse? Can it be more mean and abject? If there are any changes, will they not be for the better, though they may appear for the worst at first? Can they get us any lower? Where can they get us? They are afraid to treat us worse, for they know well the day they do it, they are gone. But against all accusations, which may or can be preferred against me, I appeal to heaven for my motive in writing, who knows that my object is, if possible, to awaken in the breasts of my afflicted, degraded and slumbering brethren, a spirit of inquiry and investigation respecting our miseries and wretchedness in this Republican land of liberty. Okay. The gauntlet is thrown. Um, we have a message here. Okay, so the that quote has just been put into the chat. So if you wanna to refer to it, you can look at it right there. I have a question. This is, um, he starts this off with, I have one question, then proceeds to ask multiple questions. So what is the power of the question? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I think that the question is a tool to uh, not directly address it, but to get you to think critically about what would be your answer. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, a, it's, it's also a device used by um, <laughs> effective speakers to engage, to, to then um, have the audience own the, the question. What is the question and how will you respond? And um, as he does, he's like asking for def definitions for you to identify yourself in some part of this question or what do you think about it? But more, more than, than that in this quote for me is this assertion of the Republican land of liberty, that mm -hmm. this is um, in that milieu of the Republican um, ideology. This is a Republic, this is a de democracy. This is where um, uh, the land of egalitarian thought and equality and all of that and justice is supposed to be in these documents of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And as you talked about MLK, you know, he said that those were the two most important documents in America. And so as these are um, looked at in the language of the uh, where uh, Jefferson is in Europe and the kind of flavor of language that is being used in these documents to speak to liberty, or as um, um, the, 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 the winds and tides of uh, freedom from colonialism and, and freedom from the, of, of America from England and freedom from um, the, the, the ravages of oppression that in this land that is supposed to be so fair um, uh, that um, John T. Hilton, who is one of the uh, Masonic uh, people in, in, in Boston talks about that, that this is a space that is boasted of liberty, Christianity and civilization. And then over 20 hundred thousands of our race are kept in perpetual slavery without one ray of hope of their ever being released from their state of bondage 
but by death. Americans, does not this picture of human depravity move you to implore the aid of your God to assist in moving this foul spot from thy country's name. And David, uh, uh, John T. Hilton was the Grand Mason of the, the Lodge here in Boston and he and, and David would be in, in, um, in conversation. And so it made me think about this, this Republican land of liberty as it's flavoring the planet as a source of human activity engaging that and yet this country is it, it, it is in the measure of um, against that very principle in enslaving men and women and children to its profit base and there is a a, a comment from a southerner a white planter that um, David writes about later he says everything must be transacted through the medium of Negroes. And when he says that, he is saying that in this Republican land of liberty, I'm supposed to be as a possessor of whiteness, I am supposed to be on top, but yet I have to still negotiate everything through people who are in that doctrine of white supremacy less than me. So for me, this is what David is pointing to. I'm sure that there are other thoughts so that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Peter, did you have something that you'd like to um, just- um, Sure, if no one else wants to go right away, but please, I hope folks will, will chime in. Um, uh, Ashley, in the original, you may recall, Republican Land of Liberty, uh, as much you referred to, is actually in italics, and there are three exclamation marks right after it. This is a device that, that Walker uses very uh, cannily, I think, throughout the uh, the document, is he he uses italics and exclamation marks, particularly when he wants to call out hypocrisy among white people, and and it, you can see it throughout the document. It's really interesting. Um, the other thing I was going to say about it is um, uh, that um, I think that the way he contrasts uh, miseries and wretchedness in the Republican land of liberty. It's a striking image contrasting those two phrases. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe somebody else want to give their own thoughts about this. We do have one comment in the chat. Um, despite saying that his condition in his country couldn't be worse, Walker rejects the colonization movement saying that black people have more claim to America than whites because of the country's, because the country's wealth had been built on black blood and tears, which is an interesting observation. I too was struck by the, it couldn't be worse. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think also just to say too, in, uh, this is the preamble, but he encapsulates just in two, two sentences what he is writing about because he says, um, how was it? Uh, uh, my, what is it? My, um, my motive in writing yes. uh, is, if possible, to awaken the breasts of my afflicted, degraded, and slumbering brethren, etc. cetera. Um, and I think he has two audiences for that. He has the black audience, and he's also telling white people, this is what's gonna happen. This is what is gonna happen. Um, and this will happen, uh, but I think he just says in that in that two sentences uh, he opens up the door for what's coming next, how he's going to build his argument uh, um, to uh, uh, to create uh, you know the the articles of the appeal that will deal with these different topics. Someone says, I believe that in summary, he actually answers the questions that he asks. So, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Um, shall we move on to the first article? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me pull that up. Okay. 
This is so sad, frankly, people. I am a bit, why can't I not do this? Hang on, I'm gonna go back and try it again. So meanwhile, Emily, if you'd throw it in the chat, everybody could get started. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh man. Okay. Will not stay. Hang on. There. Okay. Well. Emily, would you mind reading it from the chat while I wrestle with my very recalcitrant computer? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. I can read it, yeah. Thank you. Um, so from article one, I have been for years troubling the pages of historians to find out what our fathers have done for, for the white Christians of America. Do you want me to? keep going, um, to merit such condign punishment as they have inflicted on them and to continue to inflict on us their children. But I must aver that my researches have hitherto been to no effect. I have therefore come to the immovable conclusion that they, Americans, have and do continue to punish us for nothing else but for enriching them in their country. For I cannot conceive of anything else nor will I ever believe otherwise until the Lord shall convince me. Okay. Thoughts. We have Ann Moritz saying, I am imagining the fear and reactionary nature of many whites when they saw the disruptive nature of what Walker is appealing to. And four, do we have a history of white folks in his day that he actually won over? And another comment is, I wonder if he uses the word condign to put whites in their place through demonstrating their ignorance of this word and the, um, I guess the extent of his own education. It is an ironic use, I would say of the word, because I mean, how could anyone merit such a punishment? How could they how could they be talking about it that way? I just think this is biting sarcasm. For, it's brilliant old passage. I mean, it's like, all right, follow the money. That's what he's saying. Follow mm -hmm. the money. Um, and uh, and again, I that last line he wrote. Not surprisingly, perhaps, but he invokes the Lord a lot throughout. You know, in a way, I and, I, and maybe I'm, others may disagree with this, but it feels to me as though uh, he is always his, la the last card he plays is the Lord is here. And if you're not with me on this, the Lord, you, you'll answer to him. I mean, that's really throughout the whole document because um, he is going after particularly, um, this is in consequence of slavery, but uh, you know, when he gets to preachers later, you know, he really lays it on the line. <laughs> you're with me or you're really gonna be in hell. Um. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that he says um, is uh, how, we could be so submissive to a gang of men whom we cannot tell whether they are as good as ourselves or not. I never could conceive. And so in that, you know, uh, he's looking at the, these men who are in control and power, um, uh, as far as I can see, who value the, the uh, prophet over recognizing and acknowledging human beings who are in that possessive white logic to, uh, to uh, reinforce that they are entitled and this entitlement that's there, it's really implied in this for me um, and the hypocrisy with which they present uh, Christian principles to uphold that and to gird their positions 
in, in this in this space. Um, so uh, for me, uh, the Christians of America, he is questioning. You know, are you really Christian? Are you uh, holding to those um, principles? And if and if so, if if the the Bible is being used here, um, it, it, it would be used to prove that slavery and bondage was a is against all of this rather than being for it. And he does cite in the later parts of his appeal the um, uh, the credit to. Ethiopia, um, uh, I mean, Ethiopia and, and Egypt as this place of civilization and the, um, the precursor to Western civilization being civilized and what the carryover in um, the doctrine of, of being moral and the codes of those places to be moral in setting up your civilization poses this idea of what was vested in Christianity as coming from the Africans, what is becoming a, an idea and a perception of human life and civilization being that which is a precursor to America. And yet the people who look like those people are here being enslaved and serving those who put themselves on the pedestal of being the Christians in America. And um, I just think that he does this play on words that, ref that reinforces you reflecting. Like, you see this mirror? That's you, okay? And so can you, you know, look at yourself and identify what I'm saying with what's going on in this, in this place? And for me, it recognizes with the 21st century and the conversations that we've been having over the last two, two years that um, it, it's ugly head has not been cut off. It is still apparent and, and raging. Yeah. Well, let us move on to article two. We'll try this again, folks, who knows. Okay, I'll read this one. Men of color who are also of sense. For you particularly is my appeal designed. Our more ignorant brethren are not able to penetrate its value. I call upon you therefore to cast your eyes upon the wretchedness of your brethren and do your utmost to enlighten them. Go to work and enlighten your brethren. Let the Lord see you doing what you can to rescue them and yourselves from degradation. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll comment. Um, I think that I see this particular um, piece as really directed at particularly men in Boston and other places like this and, and Charleston and um, Wilmington who are who have had the benefit of education and not just calling words, but that, that these are men of reason. And then those who are have that another type of literacy who may not be necessarily lettered, but can reason through a natural ability to be able to do that, but that within that is this uh, mission to appeal to this cadre of courageous men and, and enlightened African-Americans um, who he believed would be most capable of understanding the dimensions and the urgency of this problem that, um, that they were then to organize and deliver this, there's this sec sacred world that he exists in and this secular world. And there is this idea that in the secular education of, um, of the people to invest in, um, in them, this idea that we must move together. In Boston, as I was saying before, that there had been this period of time where they were looking to going back to Africa and Im immigrating elsewhere. But here, is the admonishment to people who are here, who are 
in this place to educate and to be responsible in this, this urgent need to deliver education that would free the masses of Black people from being demoralized and, um, uh, and being delivered from ignorance of uh, not being able necessarily to put into words what it would be appealing to the abolitionists and the other uh, people who are looking at writing articles that this is the charge of those who have the wherewithal to, to do that. And that uh, also, this is a, a, a shining light, a counterweight to the perversive uh, indictment of Blacks as inferior, that this has to be um, raised as a, a subject matter that is truly invested in by those who are most affected by it. So self-agency here becomes a predominant command, I, I think, in my own uh, in my own understanding of it. Men of color, he's calling them. He's, you know, it's like one of those broadsides that we see, you know, the, when they're uh, recruiting the 54th or they're recruiting men of color, like pay attention here. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this, this thing to do that is, uh, uh, that is about you and for you and that the increase in numbers is the, the increase as he calls, calls uh, the soldiers in the Holy Army. And that this is you no know, God directed, this is God given that this is your charge. So um, uh, a lot of this comes through in what uh, the Masons have as their charter uh, under Prince Hall, but as it gets more critical as we approach the 1839 Amistad event and um, those other <clears throat> things that bring abolition to its head and its pinnacle. We have the words of David Walker that inspire this charge and this responsibility. Uh, and by the time we get to <laughs> the 20th century and, uh, and uh, somebody Sorry. like that, and parochially, uh, forgive me for those who might not know who I'm talking about, but LL Cool J uh, creates this thing for us, by us. It is about you doing it for yourself, that you are united enough. And, and in, his, in his speech in 1828, that was published in the Freedom's Journal, he talks about this uniting, nobody can do that for you, but you. So that charge is embedded in this for me. If I could just pick up quickly on, um, on that, and Lamuchi, you, you referred to the sort of commanding nature of this, and actually I had a, Kind of similar reaction when I was just going through the the wording of this article, and I found that he was it was a series of emphatic entreaties. So it's cast your eyes upon the wretchedness, do your utmost to enlighten them, go to work, let the Lord see what you are doing. It's kind of like marching orders, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, agreement. Yeah, so it's a it's a a space where um, the the, the key of inspiration and organizational structure is that you have this. So let's use it, come on, yeah. go. <laughs> In very contemporary terms, excuse me, but those are the kind of um, commands that we even get. If, I, if I'm looking at like people who call themselves woke, quote unquote, woke today, the Black Lives Matter movement and others who are participating in the larger uh, scenario of demanding rights, uh, using all of your resources that you have to make the product that you want to happen happen is a part of this, this command to be awake, this command to uh, um, use whatever is at your disposal and, and be alive with it. Um, uh, whether it's sacred or secular in your expression, it is important that it be done. So, yeah. I think also there's um, an implied promise in this. Mm -hmm. the, the last sentence where he says, let the Lord see you doing what you can to rescue them. And what came to mind for me was the Lord helps those who help themselves. So if you get out there and your, your work is recognized, 
you have a powerful ally um, who will who will stand behind you. And so anyone from the audience, one person asks, I'm confused about who it is that he wants to be enlightened. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, in that phrase, uh, in the, the, the putting forth of that, if I can read it here, um, he says uh, to do your utmost to enlighten them, to go to work and enlighten your brethren. He is talking about uh, people who have not had the advantage of uh, of uh, being taught and educated in one stream. That's one way, and, or being a part of a uh, of a group that can activate its own presence to uh, to rescue themselves from degradation. So I think he is talking to the black world. He is talking basically though, particularly to um, those enslaved here in, in America for one, but the crisis of black, being black here is for free and enslaved people. And among those, those who are most literate, when we talk about Boston as this place of literacy and development, um, there, were, there were whites in the South who were not as educated as most of the black people here. And when you look at that call that he is um, saying needs to be uh, reckoned with, to cast your eyes upon the wretchedness of your brethren, those who have less than you are the ones that he is exhorting here to do something about this situation, to, to do that. So he is talking directly to men of color that he addresses in the very first part of that sentence and inclusive of that men of color, we have to include women and children. And especially here in Boston, you have societies that are, and, and, and a Garrison Juvenile Choir, you have children who are participating in this same kind of exercise. And when they come to the African school or the ABL Smith school, they are met if they're coming from like Macon, Georgia, and they haven't been allowed to have the the uh, the um, uh, the privilege to have an education, and and denied that by law. There are children who are best scholars in those rooms who are uh, taught to help their own in this plight of being educated, being literate, being able to pick out more than what David Walker says is a call of words, but to be able to reason. And that this was the charge of people and teachers like Susan Paul, who was from a family of educators and worked in the African school to raise the level of what children thought of themselves being educated, but going beyond that to become abolitionist. So in, in terms of this, this is a, a whole um, grasp of utilizing everyone and anyone who is of sable hue, as Mariah Stewart, refers to us to have that charge who are educated and to share it and to take that on. Um, yeah, and we see the same kind of thing um, levied in, if, you, if I can use this example in revolutionary Cuba, where you know, each one teach one is the, is the, is the, the edict. And there's uh, in, in the African meeting house, as we come back to Boston, there's Tuesday night meetings where the whole community can come and learn and be involved. In other places like Philadelphia, in New York, and um, places where there were other meeting houses and gathering spaces, this was an edict to then raise the level of thinking and education of those who were denied access, so. Let's, uh, mindful of the time, we have two more articles to look at quickly. So let me uh, share the next one, please. Okay, from article three, which is called Our Wretchedness and Consequence of the Preachers of the Religion of Jesus Christ. What the American preachers can think of us, I aver this day before my God, I have never been able to define. They have newspapers and monthly periodicals, which they receive in continual succession, but on the pages of which you will scarcely ever find a paragraph respecting slavery, 
which is 10,000 times more injurious to this country than all of the other evils put together, and which will be the final overthrow of its government unless something is very speedily done, for their cup is, there, is nearly full. Perhaps they will laugh at or make light of this, but I tell you Americans, that unless you speedily alter your course, you and your country are gone. I warn you in the name of the Lord, whether you will hear or forbear to repent and reform or you are ruined. Do you think that our blood is hidden from the Lord because you can hide it from the rest of the world by sending out missionaries and by your charitable deeds to the Greeks, Irish, etc.? Yeah. Well, his audience has, I mean, his overt audience changes here. He is addressing very much, um, I, I think, the white audience. Yes, he is. Yeah. It's notable, I think, in this um, uh, in this particular article, or this excerpt from this article, that he repeats twice the warning that it's going to be all over unless you come and face the facts about slavery. I mean, he he starts off by saying, "And you and your country are gone," uh, and then. The next sentence, I warn you in the name of the Lord to repent and reform or you are ruined. Mm -hmm. um, and that's there's just in this particular section. There's a couple of other places in the appeal where he foretells the demise of the Republic in no uncertain terms. And um, uh, yeah, it's kind of a running theme. Yeah, I also think that this is the the why I call him a prophet, he is seeing the civil war. Mm -hmm. He's seeing this the advance of um, rebellion. He's already been involved in a place where rebellions are happening over and over and over again. And in a place where Virginia has decided to its its constitution to uh, to eventually end slavery. So, but yet, so gradually, because they have had the the force of the Haitian Revolution, and that these that the realization that if we are not giving rights to people, that they will rebel, they will end this in their own manner, just as we struck the chord to they, that they as white colonists struck the chord to in their dependence from Britain, even if it took military might to do so, and it did. And so in his prophetic look at the comparison of that in terms of freedom, freedom is freedom. And freedom is a moving and not static. Freedom. And as we look at through, uh, if we are able to reimagine, as David is looking at the scenario, scenario in this country, he is seeing this this change happening through military might I, I i do believe that he is really seeing that that it is not just the word of god but he talks about faith and action he talks about the action that you know you may have the faith that this is going to come about but in in terms and i'm doing this in my own words in terms of acting something has to be done and something will be done. And it's like keeping something in um, a, 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 of an explosive nature in a container. Pretty soon, the, you know, the, the reactions and the chemical processes are going to explode and America will be gone. And we witnessed that in the upheaval <clears throat> and the coming of the Civil War and the lack of reckoning with uh, what the abolitionists are uh, trying to um, um, bring about. And then if we recognize that David is in this place where he's seeing all manner of conversations about freedom, 
but all manner of how freedom is being perceived as a commodity and as a thing and what people are bringing to that conversation from their own experience. So there's different entries into this conversation just as the uh, garrison abolitionists are immediatist, but they're pacifists. Uh, Douglas is uh, a Garrisonian abolitionist up to a certain point. And then he says, oh no, I've gone through slavery. I see you know, the horrors. I've had it, you know, stripes on my back. I think that something else has to be done no matter what way it is. If it has to be military, it's gonna to come to that. And Walker having seen the, the people of the swamp area who have maroons and have armed insurrection that somebody along somewhere is providing these, this ammunition to these enslaved people so that they can be free. He is seeing that, you know, if you, you don't straighten up and, and, and the people in his area at that time were three, at least three to one um, who were black, um, that there will be no America. So, and on we shall go to Article Four, which is entitled Our Wretchedness and Consequence of the Colonizing Plan. Throw away your fears and prejudices, then, and enlighten us and treat us like men, and we will like you more than we do now hate you. And tell us now no more about colonization for America is as much our country as it is yours. But Americans, I declare to you, while you keep us and our children in bondage and treat us like brutes to make us support you and your families, we cannot be your friends. You do not look for it, do you? Treat us then like men and we will be your friends. And there is not a doubt in my mind but that the whole of the past will be sunk into oblivion and we yet, under God, will become a united and happy people. And the note is, you are not astonished at my saying we hate you. For if we are men, we cannot but hate you while you are treating us like dogs. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Someone else? Well, I guess that's in line with, you know, as you reap, you shall sow for for one, for one way of looking at it. Um, but I, I think in that, um, in that Jeffersonian document where he is, uh, Mr. Jefferson, but have given the world the remarks respecting us when we are submissive to them and so much servile deceit prevail among ourselves when we so meanly submit to their murderous slashes. It's the, this, it's this idea that Christianity is about love, it's about, um, uh, and, and Republican ideas about equality, that in, if in this I, idea of, uh, of freedom and democracy is that, why are the, the, the heads of um, people not vested in that being spread to all people. That not, we know that this is not the first instance of slavery in the world, yes, but we know that it is uh, different radically because it is dealing with the issue of race as a moniker of why would one be enslaved? And um, as we, we think about that um, and preachers being in pulpits where they can discuss the unfairness and the inequity of this instead being um, urged to then continue their, um, their, sought, their, their onslaught of people who are, who are really the backbone of this country um, yet treated in uh, unspeakable ways. He relates a story, a story. of a of a um, of a mother being whipped to death by her son because he's ordered to do so, and the horrible act of that. That is like 
uh, treating a person as a beast, but one of their own having to almost take the role of a beast to do it. Mm-hmm. Where is that in any part of any civilized society? Where is that? So this idea of uh, rec- reconciling within one's own self that this could be my fate by law, that this is not just on a wish, but that the con- this country in America girded these behaviors by law, not just religious law, but state and federal laws. We can come to the case of uh, Dred Scott, in 1857 of being deemed not even a man. So this continuous um, and continuing line of um, African being the beast and the Europeans being the human is the, the speak of the courts that I don't even have to acknowledge you as a man. I don't have to acknowledge your humanness. And so with him writing this prior to that 1857 case leads us to understand how deeply invested he was in in the message about that. If you continue to treat us like dogs, how can we love you? If Christianity is associated with love, stop that. In other words, it's, a, 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 I think, another command in him saying it that way um, that gives you some structure to um, review and reflect on what is your thought, especially directed, this is especially directed to white people in this, in this case. The merch, I have a quick question for you and I, cause I'd love your thoughts on this. In he, this is a, well, well, I think maybe one of three places in the appeal where David Walker sort of says there is hope Mm -hmm. that we can reconcile, that we can, as he puts it finally here, um, uh, that we can yet under God become a united and happy people. And he says at the beginning there, and there is no doubt in my mind that that's possible. I'm wondering what you think of that. Because I I have to say, when I read it again this time, I was like, seriously, you really believe that? Given what you've personally been through, what you see around you, do you think it was his religious faith that allowed him to be able to cling to that hope that it was possible in the end to reconcile, to end slavery and all of that? Well, I, I do think that in the deep wells of being human, uh-huh. there is this idea, if you are human, that there is another human on the earth that you can identify with, that there's this well with mm-hmm. which... Uh, like in, in metaphysics, um, we think about you know, as low as you can go, so can you go high. Mm. And so if that is where your threshold of being human rests, that hope is the protector. Hope must be anchored somewhere in the human that I, can, I will examine myself and say, what I'm doing is not right and, and it is not human. <laughs> in religious philosophy uh, and theology, I'm sorry, and the cosmology of, of uh, other religions, you, you, you find that, that space that you can occupy that says there is hope, there's light at the end of that tunnel. I can see it coming even though this is the present uh, state. So it allow, he's allowing this opportunity to turn the archive to rather than being in the space of the paranoia mm-hmm. of, uh, of not recognizing the sovereignty of people, the erasure of people, the degradation of people, that it is an opportunity to get a hold of yourself. And, and, and grasp that this is shameful 
are we going to repair? Or are we going to continue in that shamefulness? So I, I think it is his call in a way of saying, you know, that we can be better and that we can, we can un unlock that. But all of that must be checked, that mm -hmm. what has been happening is satanic, if you will. Mm -hmm. It is, it is uh, you know, um, um, indicative of, uh, of what would be attributed to devils. And so mm -hmm. as we think about this, do, is that where we want to be? More or less is his, I think, that's just me, but that is his assertion that there is hope for humanity. And I think we all operate with that. And Brian Stevenson said, uh, as a lawyer who has uh, worked in the Mississippi Delta and, you know, been applying himself in a contemporaneous um, um, manner to what white supremacy has brought and white possessive thought has brought in the in the country, even after slavery and the impact of the complexity and the nature of slavery. Um, and people who are flying these Confederate flags and uh, he's told numerous stories, but one of them that, that um, one of his quotes was that we, we have hope, that we must protect our hope mm -hmm. and that we must um, have it as something that taps us on the shoulder when we're thirsty. Um, and this idea that uh, no matter what the state is, we can't give that up. Because if we give that up, we're gone. And then in the Testament of Hope by MLK, um, um, you, you have that same embrace. So it is a moral issue. It is an issue of being human. It is in the testaments, it is in the stories, it is in Kemet, Kush. It's all in those places where civilization has its hold on us and in our writings to be able to rise to a better level. So that's what I saw when I read that. Thank you for asking. Thanks. Well, I see that we've arrived at 824. Um, and as we tie things up, I'd like to reiterate what Lamarchi just pointed to, which is, I think on the one hand, there is hope. And then the other hand, there is the question, is this who we want to be? And I think if we can hold those two things at the same time in our heart, um, it can be a very helpful way to not only read David Walker, but to think about today. So I wanna thank you, Peter and Lamerchi, very much for your insight and the conversation. And I wanna thank our audience. Um, and I wanna thank Citizens Bank too for helping make conversation like this possible. So have a good night, everybody. <laughs>